This is the city, Portland, Oregon. It's home to many kinds of viruses, bacteria, and fungi. Some help with digestion. Some produce some of the finest wines and cheeses in the world. And some have helped put Oregon on the map as a microbrew mecca. Sometimes they aren't so obliging, causing serious illness. When that happens, I go to work. I carry a badge. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names and some of the data have been messed with to protect the innocent. It was Wednesday, May 2nd. We were working the day watch out of communicable disease prevention. The boss is Dr. Paul Seaslack. My partner is Sal Manella. My name's Friday. We got a call from an infectious disease doc at OHSU. She had a positive immunoglobulin for measles in an unvaccinated nine-year-old who'd returned a couple of weeks ago from Italy. It was time for public health to go into action. It's confirmed. It's here. Get me North Central CD. Terry, did you hear? Did you hear about our youngster with measles? Yeah, that's that's why I'm here. Give me the news. Okay. Well, based on our chart, sounds like it's pretty much textbook. The fever started four days ago, uh, early Sunday, while she was traveling home with her family from Italy, and on the way, she started to get runny nose, cough, coryza, and then the fever started yesterday about midday. So do we know, did she go to school while she was contagious? Well, it looks like we dodged a bullet there. Because she was sick on the weekend, her family kept her home. We still need to track down vaccination status of her brothers and sisters. When did she first go to see her health care provider and get evaluated? Well, you're not going to like this. Uh, what? Well, she was in the emergency room on Tuesday and sent home with a diagnosis of viral syndrome. Uh, and then, actually, she went to visit her grandmother in the hospital oh. on the way home. Then she went to the pediatrician's office the next morning, but they weren't thinking measles either. Is she at least in isolation now? Yep. Jeremy's going over to talk with the parents right now, so we'll confirm as much of this story as we can, and he's going to get started on contact investigation. And it sounds like her exposure was probably while she was over in Italy? That's what we're thinking. We don't have a history that she went anywhere else, so we'll check to see whether she was exposed to anybody with similar symptoms during her exposure period. Uh, and since she was on a flight while she was infectious, I already called the state, and they're working with CDC to pin down flight information uh, manifests and get started with notifications. After confirming the diagnosis and reviewing available medical records, since measles is rare in the United States and is spread by the airborne route, there are several special considerations when interviewing a measles patient. First and foremost, protect yourself. When interviewing an actively ill case patient, follow recommended airborne isolation precautions, even if you're fully vaccinated. To stop other chains of transmission that public health might not yet have recognized, it's worthwhile to try to track down the source of the case patient's infection. Ask about anyone with illness and rash that the case patient had contact with during the seven to 18 days prior to onset of fever, especially the 13 to 15 days before rash onset. For any people sick with fever or rash, get names, addresses, and phone numbers. Also ask about travel outside of Oregon during the incubation period as well as any visitors from outside the U.S. Now you're ready to turn to the meat of contact investigation, identifying people who are exposed to the case patient. 
Thanks so much for talking with me today, Ms. Salisbury. Of course. So measles is easily spread from one person to another, and we need to find out about the people who may have been exposed to it during the time of the infection. So in this case, we're looking at April 27th uh, to the date that she was admitted back into the hospital, which was last night. Um, if we can identify those folks who are at risk, uh, we can reduce that through vaccines and medications. Um, can you help me with that? Yeah, sure. Okay, great. So first question first, does Laura have any brothers or sisters? Yes, uh, older brother and older sister, Jeff and Susie. Jeff and Susie, mm -hmm. great. And are they vaccinated against measles? Yes, they are. They are? And I would thought you might want their records, so I brought them. Great you job, yes, records. perfect. Yeah, this is really helpful. Great. Um, perfect. And sure. I know that Laura's not vaccinated against measles. Is that correct? Yeah, we went to a different doctor uh, for Laura, and that doctor really encouraged us not to get vaccinated against measles, said it wasn't necessary. Um, now we go to Dr. Hillman, um, and it just never came up. Is there any other family members in the house uh, outside of brothers and sisters? Uh, yeah, my husband, John. John. Yeah. I heard Laura first got sick during the flight back from Italy. Do you know which flight that was? Oh, yeah. Let me check. Okay. Um, so it wasn't the flight from Italy. We went from Milan to Frankfurt, mm -hmm. and that was, just one second, uh, that was Alitalia 264. Mm -hmm. She wasn't sick then. Okay. The flight from Frankfurt to Portland is when she got sick. Um, and that was Lufthansa flight 1320. Um, so she's getting sick on that flight 1320, coming home. Are there any other activities you can think of? Um, anything else that she might have been a part of when she got home? No, so after we got home um, from that trip, she okay. was pretty sick, so yeah. we just stayed at home. That makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay, so just stayed home. To help identify settings in which contacts might have been exposed to measles, Ask about contact with others at home and any visit to or work in a doctor's office, clinic, or hospital. Get the exact time and date. Also, find out about time spent at a school, daycare, college, prison, and so forth. Since measles can hang in the air for two hours, ask about and record any indoor group activity attended. For example, churches, theaters, tourist locations, parties, athletic events, family gatherings, and the like. It's also worth asking about travel during the communicable period that might have exposed others, such as on a plane or train. So based on Laura's medical chart, it sounds like she visited the emergency room Tuesday morning and then went to Dr. Hillman on Wednesday. Is that right? Uh, y yeah. So, so Tuesday, that Tuesday we went into the ER. Um, I think it was like 10.30. Okay, 10.30. Um, and we were there maybe a half hour before we were seen, and then okay. maybe we were done. Uh, we weren't there very long, done around noon. Okay, great. So yeah. 10 to noon. And I understand you spent some time in the hospital a little later that day, is that right? Yeah, right after the ER. So my mother-in-law, uh, Laura's grandma, had just had hip surgery. Um, and the ER, they said that Laura would be okay, no worries. Um, and so we thought, well, let's go visit grandma and maybe cheer up after her hip surgery. Oh. Yeah. And which floor did you visit? Do you remember and like about what time? Yeah. So let's see. ER, we left about one. We decided to go over there. Maybe got there one, one fifteen. Okay. And uh, we stayed until about two. We didn't want to stay too long. Um, and what floor? That's where all the people who are recovering from hip surgeries are. I think mm. 2C. Well, that's great. And then after that, the next day, you went over to Dr. Hillman's office. Do you remember about what time you were there? Yeah, sure. Yeah, we did do a follow-up with Dr. Hillman. Mm -hmm. and our appointment was at 8.30, mm -hmm. and we got there a little bit earlier than okay. that, and um, by 9 o'clock we were done. By 9 o'clock. Yeah. And then I just want to confirm this. Any other people have you thought of that she might have had um, been exposed to that might have been there when she was sick in your travels? Um, no, we left the airport, we went home, went to the ER, went mm -hmm. to the doctors, um, and now she's here. But no, we didn't have any visitors, so just family, nobody else. Because measles is very infectious and spreads through airborne aerosols, 
It can occasionally infect susceptible people up to 30 meters away and can sometimes hang in the air for two hours. However, most people in the U.S. are immunized with an effective vaccine, so the resource cost of trying to find and interview all people who were within 30 meters of the case patient would outweigh the public health benefit. A practical approach in most situations is to ask about people exposed to the case patient indoors within 10 meters of where the case patient was within 20 minutes of the case patients being there at some point between four days prior to rash onset and four days after rash onset. These criteria should work in most settings. More aggressive, broader contact tracing might be considered in certain high-risk situations. For instance, in healthcare settings where there might be many who are immunocompromised or in schools with high vaccine exemption rates. You know, Lisa, I figured you'd already be all over this. Well, as soon as I heard that she was admitted, I went back and looked at the list of people seen in the ER Tuesday when she was there. I checked our occupational health database. All staff have been vaccinated. Well, that's good. I do have to break the news to you. We just found out recently that she was also on 2C visiting, uh, uh, visiting a patient between 1 and 2 on Tuesday. That kind of ups the ante, doesn't it? Yep. So we discussed this with Dr. Cieslak. The first step with all of these contacts is to find out if they have evidence of immunity to measles. For people who don't, uh, if they're in the right age range and they aren't pregnant or immunocompromised, then a dose of MMR within 72 hours of exposure could actually help prevent measles or at least make it less severe. Exposed folks who are immunocompromised, pregnant, and kids less than one year old, or others with a contraindication to MMR vaccine should get immune globulin. Uh, it might help actually limit infection if we can get it uh, within six days after the exposure. Well, we can put together a list of people exposed in the ER or on the wards and call you if we need any help. That'd be great. Uh, the office manager at Dr. Hillman's is pulling together uh, contacts for their office too. And we've asked them to get information for anyone who was in the waiting room or otherwise within 10 meters of where the child was within 20 minutes after she was there. So is that what we should use to identify people exposed in the hospital? Well, we we talked about that with Paul Cieslak. Any, uh, patient who was on 2C during the day the patient visited, we'd consider exposed. So we'll need to check their medical conditions and anyone who was pregnant and has no evidence of immunity to measles should be offered Ig. Also, people who are immunocompromised should be offered immunoglobulin whether or not they've been vaccinated before. Uh, it'd be great to ask about anyone who visited 2C that day as well. For visitors, we'll only need to contact people who were on the ward within 20 minutes of the child being there. So that would be between 1 and 2.20 that afternoon. If you can get phone numbers, Lisa, that would be great because then we could uh, check if people have evidence of immunity. And if they don't, uh, they might still benefit from MMR if we can get it to them within a day. Okay, we'll get right on it. In addition to collecting and recording the names and any available contact information for all those meeting the contact definition you're using, get contact information for the organizers of any indoor group events that the case patient attended during the communicable period, or someone with the schedule of appointments at a facility if the index patient attended one there. A good list of measles contacts is often more of a mosaic assembled from multiple sources than it is a homogeneous product dependent solely on input from the case patient. As you talk to more people, add any additional contacts you identify. Once you've developed your list of measles contacts, divide them up among whomever is able to talk with them and start contact interviews. A good first step is to determine whether the exposed person you're talking with has evidence of immunity. If people meet criteria for presumed immunity, their risk of infection is likely low, and you can simply review the signs and symptoms of measles and ask them to call their healthcare provider and arrange for evaluation in the unlikely event that symptoms arise. No additional vaccine or immunoglobulin is indicated. Any of the following are considered acceptable evidence of immunity. Birth before 1957, laboratory confirmed disease, 
laboratory evidence of immunity, that is protective antibody titers, or documentation of vaccination as follows. Preschool children, one dose. Children in grades K through 12, two doses. Women of childbearing age, one dose. Healthcare personnel born during or after 1957, two doses. Students at post high school educational institutions, two doses. International travelers at least 12 months of age, two doses. Children six through 11 months of age who plan to travel internationally, one dose. All other adults, one dose. Contacts who don't meet any of these criteria are considered susceptible to measles infection. Susceptible contacts who aren't pregnant, have no life-threatening allergy to components of the vaccine, aren't infected with untreated active tuberculosis, and who have a normally functioning immune system might benefit from measles vaccine. If it's given within 72 hours of exposure, it can prevent or limit the severity of infection. Susceptible contacts who are pregnant women, children less than a year old, and others for whom measles vaccine is contraindicated could potentially lessen the severity of infection by using immune globulin if it is given within six days of exposure. Contacts considering immune globulin use should be counseled that it is not likely to prevent measles outright and that it could extend the incubation period sometimes to as long as 28 days. Information about the dosage and route of administration of immune globulin is available in the Oregon Public Health Division Measles Investigative Guideline. In settings where many people are susceptible, such as a school with high exemption rates, susceptible contacts should be encouraged to stay home during days 5 through 21 after exposure, to watch for symptoms, and to call their health care provider to arrange evaluation if these symptoms develop. This is also true for susceptible health care workers who are exposed to an infectious measles patient if appropriate infection control measures weren't used. Measles contact investigations are sometimes challenging. In this module, we've covered many of the key elements of contact identification, assessment, and education. We understand, though, that issues will come up in any measles investigation. If you have questions or just want to talk things through, don't hesitate to give us a call at the State Health Department. We're glad to help.